Section 2.7, ions and ionic compounds. If you remember, the electrons are free to move in a cloud around the nucleus. The nucleus is bound tight together. The protons and the neutrons are in an amazingly tight little knot. Uh, but the electrons are free to move, and the electrons can actually migrate from one atom to another. That, in fact, that's what electricity is, electrons moving. Uh, but if an electron is added or removed from a neutral atom, it's no longer neutral because it's neutral only because the, the negative electrons are exactly the same number as the positive protons. So if you remove an electron, you removed one of the negatives, it now has a net positive charge. If you gain an electron, well, then you have more negatives than you have positives, then you have a net negative charge. So you're going to end up with a charge, and that charge is called an ion. So if you have an atom that is has a positive or negative charge, they're called ions. So gener generic is called ions, but more specifically, if they are uh, positive, which means an electron is lost, then that's called a cation. So um, monoatomic cations are formed by metals. You're going to see that anything over here on the left side of the, the uh, periodic table, and even these metals here, will lose electrons. And these guys will gain electrons. So that means anything on the left, if it becomes an ion, tends to become positive. And they are cations. So I remember learning that cations has a T in it. So a cation has a positive charge right there in the middle, and an anion, which means negative charge, has a negative, it has an N in it, like negative. So an anion would be formed whenever uh, something takes on an electron, where, where a, a neutral element steals an electron and puts it to itself. Uh, and they do that for various reasons of stability. It's, it's an electrical stability thing. They want to be more stable for, for whatever electrical reason. So if you were to have these guys, they steal electrons and become negatives. They become anions. These guys on the left and in the middle will, will give away electrons and as such become positive charged cations. So here are some common cations. Here's some positive ones. If you notice, many of these are from the first column, the first group. Uh, they all behave alike. So anything in the first group, first column, will tend to give away an electron and become positively one charged. Likewise, the positive two, many of those are from the, uh, the magnesium and the calcium, strontium, barium. These are all from the second column. Not not all uh, of them, but, but many of them are. And it's that second column uh, that they tend to become positive two. You're going to see the same thing in positive three. That third column, aluminum, will be positive three for that reason. Um, also, you're going to have uh, some polyatomic ions. A polyatomic ion is more than one atom that's fixed together and uh, as such has a charge. So that's an ammonium ion. Also, some of these transition metals uh, have funny names. So copper, this is Cu copper, and it's got one positive, but you call it copper one. You actually have a Roman numeral in the name. Um, a lot of the ones that are in that middle part of the, of the periodic table are going to do that. So you're going to have a lot of these Cobalt 2, Copper 2, Iron 2, Manganese 2, Mercury 2, Lead, whatever. And then um, they have to be named a very special way. Some common anions, these guys are all on the left or the right side of the periodic table. So um, negative 1, many of these are from group 7. So 1 away from the noble gases. Negative 2, a lot of these are negative uh, two because they're in group six. They're two away from the noble gases. So that noble gas configuration has something to do with what causes ions. And we'll see those uh, later. And again, I told you that there was a
uh, some that are more than one atom called polyatomic. That's This is the big long one everyone's scared of. This is acetate, C2H3O2, all negative one. So the whole thing acts as a negative one. Uh, and then chlorate, perchlorate, nitrate, permanganate, uh, car carbonate, chromate, dichromate, sulfate, phosphate. So we'll look at these later, these polyatomic ions, more than one atom. So an ionic compound is made of ions, a positive and a negative. So, so a cation will always join with an anion and they'll always be neutral. So if you have a positive one joining with a positive one, it's great. They cancel each other out and they're very stable. If you have a positive two and it wants to join with a negative one, it's possible, but you're going to have to have more than one. So if you were to have like sodium, this is sodium chloride here, sodium, which is positive one, and chlorine, which is negative one, it comes together to make, to make sodium chloride. But if you were to have sodium and sulfur, which is negative two, well, in order to balance with negative two, I have to have two positive ones. So I would have S Na two S. We'll talk about that later. So ionic compounds are generally formed between metals and nonmetals. So cations, remember, is to the left side of the periodic table, anions to the right. So an ionic compound it usually has one positive and negative together, and so that they are ionic. We talked about molecular compounds that form molecules and they share electrons. Ionic compounds. They steal and become ions, and then once they're ions, they stick together just like for static electricity. Static electricity sticks them together. So an ionic compound is made up of two ions, a cation and an anion, or more than one, two, as long as they all cancel each other's charges out. So the electrons are transferred from the metal, so they lose an electron, they become a cation. The nonmetal then takes that electron, the nonmetal becomes an anion, and then once one is positive, one's negative, then there's an electrical, electrostatic uh, attraction between the two of them. So this is a salt molecule. It's not really a molecule because it's it's zillions. Like you can have a you could have a piece of salt that would be just a few atoms big, and you could have a piece of salt as big as a building, one one grain of salt. Uh, because they form a matrix. They just basically sit in um, in a very specific uh, flat way. That's why that the sides are all flat. The, in this case, the sodium, um, the sodium is very little, and the chlorine, uh, the sodium ion is very little, and the chlorine ion is really big, and the, and the little sodium just sits in the little cracks between the chlorine and fits perfectly. And so you end up with beautiful cubes of salt and the, the cubes of salt can be enormous can be humongous um, I looked once through a through one grain of salt as big as a car and it was transparent you could look through it and see the other side it was a crystal where light could go through totally awesome these are some polyatomic ions so this is ammonium where you have um, this is nitrogen and four hydrogens, and the entire thing has a positive charge. So it's NH4 positive. So instead of just one monoatomic ion, where it's just one, one uh, atom that has become an ion, this whole kind of group has become an ion and acts like it. It can stick together. So for instance, this one thing could join with a negative one and make a beautiful ammonium chloride compound. Totally cool. So what else? There's um, hydroxide, OH, all of it has a charge. Nitrate, NO3, all has a charge. And then the sulfate, uh, SO4, and it all has a negative 2 charge. When you're writing formulas, you need to make sure that the charges balance. So if you do have Na1, Cl, minus 1, they come together as NaCl. 
That's table salt, sodium chloride. If you have something a little weirder, you're going to have to pack them together. So I've already mentioned, so you could have sodium chloride, where it's a one-to-one. -one. You also had sodium sulfide, where it's two-to-one. Well, you could also have two to three. Let's say you have ammonia, uh, aluminum, which is, I'll put this up here for a second. Let me put it in red. Aluminum is three plus. And let's make it go with oxygen. Oxygen is two minus. Well, how do I get them to balance? I need the same amount of charges on both. So I need a charge that three will go into and that two will go into. So I need a multiple of three and two. So six would be the first common multiple. So what times positive three is positive six? Well, two is. And what times negative two is negative six? Well, three is. So if you see that what's actually happened, you've got this two, that is the, it's the charge up here, which by the way, you never write, that's just in your head, become the, the charge of the oxide becomes the subscript of the aluminum, and the charge of the aluminum becomes the subscript of the oxide. So Al, Al2O3. So here's uh, at the top, manganese and nitro nitrogen, uh, or magnesium and nitrogen. So you have magnesium, which is in the second column, so it's 2 plus. Nitrogen, which is in the, the fifth column, so it's 3 minus. Well, if you want to join a 2 plus and a 3 minus, you need a 6. 2 times 3 is 6. 3 times 2 is 6. But if you simply want to just kind of crisscross... The two, be, the two, which is the charge, becomes the subscript of the N. The three, which is the charge, becomes the subscript of the MG. Now, those charges are just in your head because you never write them. You're only writing the subscript. So, magnesium nitride is M3N2. So, the charge of the cation becomes the subscript on the anion. The charge of the anion becomes the subscript of the cation. And these subscripts are not in the lowest whole number ratio, um, it, or if they're not, then you need to divide them by the greatest common factor because you you have the smallest number of ratio in a formula. You um, can have a molecular formula like C6H12O6, but its empirical formula would be CH2O. We talked about that before.